These are the uh, four uh, sections we're going to cover here uh, tonight. The agenda is going to be blockchain use cases, algorithm, blockchain basics, what's included on layer one, as well as some great developer tools we're going to be going over here today. So Props Network is the very first one uh, that we're going to discuss here. Props is a uh, turns app users into loyal financial stakeholders. So those of you that do build apps out there tonight, this is a mobile dev crowd. They have widgets that you can include in your application that you're building that have a, basically a, it's a loyalty program is what it is. There's a very simple API to invoke this. Just there's a simple API to, to do ads on your apps. Uh, same type of thing. And so it's SEC approved, like a system for token holders. Token is a key word here, right? So tokens are analogous to assets on the blockchain. I will show you how to create assets on the blockchain. You can build your own like Rust coin if you want, or your own coin, cryptocurrency. And we'll show you how to do that here today. A good video about the props is up here on this video link. We also have a YouTube channel, YouTube slash Algran is where you can find that out. The next one here is Circle and Coinbase, the central consortium. Now, this is huge, right? You got payments and treasury infrastructure for the internet. They accept payments both in the uh, traditional fashion, MasterCard, Visa, and all that, but they also do crypto. And through the blockchain infrastructure, all transactions are done. It's very global, it's scalable, and it's very efficient. A USD is the fastest growing stable coin. So one of the problems inherent, and you may have heard about this or read about it, is the fluctuation of cryptocurrency. And one day it's very high, the next day it's very low. It makes it really tough to do transactions like that. People can get burned just by the timing of the price of that uh, cryptocurrency. So what USDC does, it's a stable coin, which is tied to the US economy. So as the US economy fluctuates a little up or down, so does the USDC coin. So it's brilliant when you think about it. So now you can conduct transactions very similar to what you're doing right now with the U.S. dollar. And it's, it's got the same kind of scale. What else is important on this slide? The, they leverage traditional payments, but the ones that are through the blockchain, going from a blockchain account to blockchain account, it's just the sender and the receiver. There's no middleman. And that's what makes it really quick. And that's what makes, there's what, 2.2 billion people on this planet that, la that lack access to modern financial services. And this is going to help that. Not everybody can whip up in a bank account. There's a lot of folks out there that just don't have that capability. And to find a Western Union in some geos is very difficult. So a lot of things here are good. Scalable is very important, right? Do you want this thing to be globally available as well as fast? And this is something that I think we're going to see more of here. So again, another use case up on our site. Other use cases. Now, these I got from the China blockchain report. So China's on board as well in 2020. And they're looking at using it for uh, tamper-proof charity organizations. And the title of the report, if I recall, is Blockchain is Not the Future. It's the present, right? So a lot of these are already in the works in terms of the solutions that they're building. So there was a time about 10 years ago was one of the big um, hurricanes that hit. They had a misuse of funds. They could not uh, find where the donations were coming from or where they were going to. So really what you need is an audit trail. And that's a characteristic of a blockchain is the fact that audit trails are built right in. And it's very easy to detect tampering of data. So those are a lot of benefits now we're starting to talk about with the Y blockchain. Also voting, big issue here in the States, that's for sure. Tamper proof. Again, very easily detect if any tampering has been done to the voting chain, the blockchain. Healthcare, global access and medical records. Boy, that would be nice to have available to no matter where you're at. Even folks, maybe if they get in an accident, maybe they're incap incapacitated. They can't write down all of their medical records. It really needs to be at the site of coverage for wherever the healthcare professional is at to be able to have access to this and you actually to control what's in your medical records, right? So it's, it belongs to you, right? So these are things to keep in mind. In all of these verticals, we're starting to see applications now for blockchain. Automotive industry, another one, the supply chain, anything with supply chain, where you got checks along the way, 
think of that as an immutable ledger process. You, you, know, you check it off, you're good to go, you go to the next step. So these are things that are, are very important and very applicable for blockchain. They're even put on IoT sensors on the wear and tear of spare parts in the engine. And the stuff is getting written directly to the blockchain. You can actually run a node on a Raspberry Pi. I have one right here, ready to go. And Philip just uh, submitted some tutorials actually, right, Philippe, on that for the Algorand dev portal. So we're going to be taking a look at uh, doing that when I get done with this, this session the rest of the week. I'm going to start playing with that. So I'm looking forward to that. So DeFi, though, is by far and away the largest solution on blockchain. It exploded last year, primarily in the second half of the year. And the, the explosion is going to continue on through the end of this year as well. So what we have here is a $1 trillion, right, in cumulative blockchain network value in 2020. And this is all documented in the Masari report. Uh, dot io I recommend that link at the bottom and in 2021 three trillion dollars that's mind-boggling three trillion dollars are forecast in the blockchain industry so algorand DeFi examples include idex monorarium polka dot stable coins like tether usdc that we talked about uh, these are all examples more examples here with world chess and planet watch and republic and tether uh, really a lot of companies now are in our use case part of the site the ecosystem is growing uh, leaps and bounds. This is a very exciting time. I remember when I started at Microsoft, I worked for them for about um, uh, 12 years, it was back in 97. And the feeling was like that then, where you're starting to grow in a company and everybody in the company is excited about it. And everybody in the community is really getting ramped up on that time when it was Visual Basic and, and doing third party controls. And history repeats itself sometimes. When you get a good thing and a good technology going, it really does fester to itself. It really builds itself into uh, a big uh, steamroller, which is really great. So over 500 companies now on the Algorand platform, one of the three blockchains uh, with the top two stable coins, USDC and USDT, over a thousand plus nodes, 500 plus ambassadors, lots on this slide. Finally, we'll end this section with some quotes, proven success in the Algorand. You got a test dev over there with the excellent documentation. They, they were up and running just a few days. The transaction fees are really low, right? They've got the you know, transaction fees of a 20th of a cent. And then speed and scalability is another uh, big issue. And look down in the bottom right, you got blockchain, other blockchain platforms. Transaction costs are very expensive and the speed is painfully slow. Algorand is a game changer. So lots of performance capabilities. That's really the bottom line. So let's get into the Algorand basics. So an Algorand blockchain is like an immutable ledger, distributed ledger. So everybody's got a copy of it. And basically there's only a handful of record types in this ledger. You got blocks, which is at a certain point in time on our blockchain, they're burned every five seconds. Now, during that five seconds, transactions get written to the blockchain. So it's a read-only blockchain write once. And when you're writing that block, then you have transactions that are associated with that interval of time. And so now you got transaction information from account to account. So transactions are associated with accounts. And then each account has things like assets and applications are smart contracts. And assets are something that we are going to be talking more about, but those are your tokens, right? That we've been talking about. So pretty simple when you look at the whole mix here. Now let's talk about what, how these are actually built, right? One at a time, right? So some of you may have heard of forks or proof of work with other blockchains like Bitcoin, for example, and it takes over 10 minutes to burn a block there. And there's forks that happen where competing machinery is trying to compute equations, it's not green. It's not green at all. And, and so a lot of times transactions want to be written on that fork, you get or orphaned, then it goes to another fork. So there's a lot of problems, especially when you start thinking about point of sale, scalability, and performance. So with Algorand, we don't use either of those. We don't use proof of work or we don't use forks. Now, what we use is best described here by talking about the Byzantine generals problem back in the day, where you have all of these generals that need to communicate in the empire before they plan an attack. 
So you have messengers that go around to all the generals that say, okay, how are your supplies? How are your soldiers? What's the weather looking? Are you going to be able to attack if we attack? And then you go around and you get a nice consensus. So if everybody agrees, yeah, this is the time to do it, then we're going to go ahead and boom, we're going to attack. Now, there's some problems here. Number one, the messengers may break a leg. The messengers may get corrupted. The messengers may encounter bad weather. So you won't necessarily have all of the players on board. That's one problem. Pro the second problem is scalability. Once you start involving, say you're at 10 people here, 10 generals, the, the, the costs get exponential in trying to accomplish that task. It could be 10 squared. But then if you get to like a million people, now you're like at a million squared in terms of the cost, which just doesn't scale no matter what planet you're on. All right. Silvio McCauley figured it out. He's our founder of Algorand. He's also a Turing Award winner. And I just, I'm telling you, I'm in the presence of greatness on this team. It's just, it's mind boggling. And so he came up with the BRF, the verifiable random function, the statistics. That's really what it is. You really don't need everyone to participate. What you need is a representative sample. And that's it in a nutshell. So this is how it works. You got your blockchain sitting out there. You get a small random committee of all users. And then the committee agrees on the block of transactions. Every member verifies transactions and digitally signs it. This is where you also check for things like, does the account have enough money to fund this transaction? And are they doing double spending? But these are all things that are covered by the protocol. The protocol checks all of this. And then if it all looks good, then the block is added to the chain. And then every five seconds, this goes on and it does it again. So that's how it works. That's the key idea. So this brings us to permission to versus permissionless and public versus private. Well, a public blockchain is a permissionless blockchain and a private blockchain is a permissioned blockchain. So by permissionless, anyone can join, read, write with, write once with the blockchain network. It's decentralized. So anyone can join, read, write uh, with the blockchain network, and also it is decentralized. No one has control over the network. It's secure. Data cannot be changed once it is validated. There's one-way hashing algorithms that will point to the next block so you can see where they came from. Restrictions on who is allowed to participate in the network on the permission side of things. So allowed and select transactions and authentication is required on the blockchain itself. Now. The next point to make here is this, the types of blockchain apps. I know when I first started using blockchain, it was something that I was wondering, gee, public and open, I get that, but that's really not applicable, is it? For all these types of applications you're seeing here, it's good for currencies, betting, video games, all that stuff makes sense. What about voting? You want this public because you want the public to see the end result, but maybe you want it closed while the voting is going on. And the same thing with whistleblowers. And what about down in the bottom right, private and open, right? Supply chain. Again, you eventually want this thing to be open. You got government financial records fall into that category. And then the most strict on the bottom left, private and closed, national defense, law enforcement, military tax returns. On public blockchains like Ethereum, like uh, Bitcoin, uh, Algorand, and a few others, you have the ability to provide authentication on top of that, off of the blockchain on your applications that use the blockchain, for example. And it's up to you and your development team to provide that authentic authentication. And there are also third-party controls and products that help facilitate that as well on the Algorand blockchain. But it's really up to you and your developer staff to come up with that. Now, we have a, a note field, for example, on transactions that's freeform. You can use that any way that you wish. You can create a structure and tie it right into that transaction. So that would help facilitate things like that. And also, we got smart contracts and atomic transfers and all this good stuff we're going to be talking about to help get you to this point to help you do this. So really, any of these applications are doable. All right, that's really the bottom line on our public, our public blockchain. And to end the section on the pure proof of stake protocol, that's what our protocol is named after, pure proof of stake. The scalability, we, we heard mentioned that, well, how scalable is it? It's been pegged at a thousand transactions per second and it's getting better and under five, five second block times and it's getting better. So true scalability. 
infrastructure, longevity, everything is open sourced. So you can actually see how we are, what our consensus model is, right? There's no questions. It's all there. Technical flexibility, lots of SDKs. When do you see all of the SDKs that are out there right now? Some by Algorand, some by the community. That's really flourishing. I know, Joe, you said you did some Unity work just this past week. A Unity SDK came out. I didn't even oh, get the, wow. I didn't even get the peel under the covers with it yet, you know, but it's yeah, there. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, so I'm looking uh, forward to that one. I need to try yeah. it out. <laughs> All you game developers out there, right? Now's your yeah. now's your time, right? Now you can go start doing this stuff. Yeah. As well as platform extensibility, energy efficient, running it, you can run on a Raspberry Pi, uh, cost efficient, under a penny. Are you kidding me? Under a penny per transaction. And true security, you know, built right into the blockchain. So Here's a video for homework assignment. You can go ahead and watch this. And uh, this is a great video. I think it's about nine minutes long about the uh, the core protocol, the pure proof of stake. All right, we're going to get into layer, layer one features. So layer one versus layer two, right? Layer one features are built into the blockchain itself. That's the best way you can think of it. Layer two solutions are built on top of it. So this is really the biggest consideration here is scale. You need to have scale for a global blockchain. That is part of the uh, trilemma, right? That Algorand has scalability, security, and you know p- performance, right? It's got to be fast and it's got to scale. If you try to put a VM, for example, on layer one, that's really going to bog it down. It's got to be lean and mean. It's got to be extremely quick, no matter what you do. And we've learned Algorand's a modern blockchain. Other blockchains have learn the hard way, right, on doing these things in terms of scalability. This is what we're going to talk about in this section is layer one features with uh, using ASA, Algorand standard assets, atomic transactions, uh, smart contracts, and rekeying. Let's map these onto our little diagram. So atomic transactions really wrap around transactions, right? So you can group one or more transactions to an atomic transfer. And this means it all fails or it all works. Also, you have accounts and you could rekey accounts by swapping out the private key. We'll define these a little bit more as we go along here. And Algorand smart contracts really are the applications we're talking about and standard assets. I did see one question in the queue on NFTs and what's the difference to ETH uh, NFTs. Those are created with smart contracts. Ours are native to the later layer one, ASAs are tokens, right, that you can create on the network, both NFTs and fungible tokens as well. And again, I'll I'll address that more in the session coming up. So this is uh, kind of the lay of the land at a high level. Let's talk about a little bit more in depth here and on standard assets. This is where you create native native, uh, tokens. You can see the administrator functions on the diagram at the right with the manager address, a freeze address, a reserve address, and a clawback address. Those are all functions that are associated with the management of assets. You also have asset spam protection. This allows uh, users to not to protect themselves. You have to opt into an asset in order to receive it. And what this does is it avoids blindly sending assets across the blockchain. Okay. And yes, we can, yeah, thanks a lot for putting that in the chat window. We can create NFTs as well with Algorand. And uh, we'll talk about this and momentarily we're getting right up on that. So this resides on layer one. And here we go. Our fungible tokens, right? In-game points, stable coins, loyalty points, system credits, cryptocurrencies, restricted fungible tokens for securities. Maybe you want some clawback features there. But also we got NFTs, right? And these are becoming increasingly popular. These are in-game items, supply chain, real estate, identity. Really the biggest thing you got to do is just give it a quantity of one, right? You're going to create one. It's unique. And that's really what NFTs are all about. For folks that are new to NFTs, think of of real estate. You have a house that's got a two-bedroom house on one street, a two-bedroom house on another one. So it's the same characteristics, but they're in a different neighborhood. So there's you know, different metadata around each of those places to give them different price values. I saw an NFT. I was reading uh, the first tweet that went out from Twitter is an NFT. And so you could buy that for a lot of money. So collectibles, right, are a big part of that. Restricted section, again, real estate, as well as ownership registries and regulatory certifications. So let's take a look at how you do this visually. I'm going to bring up one of our uh, tools in the community here. And basically, this is Algo Desk.io. It's a great tool to use with uh, smart contracts. 
as well as assets. I'm gonna show you the asset piece here. And so this is the private key that we're gonna have. We're gonna copy this off. This is how you would restore your account. This is the key that you wanna store in a safe somewhere. You don't wanna use it on your email. You don't wanna store it on your computer. You wanna store it like in a Nano Ledger X or a, a wallet or something like that. And uh, so that is the private key. So let's go ahead and get started. If you have an account with a private key, you can put it in there and still use this. And so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go ahead and create an asset. And let's call this pizza supply. Let's go with one decimal. So we're gonna do 10,000 of these dot zero. So it has one decimal place in it. You've got the ability to put a URL in and then metadata hash. You can do a hash of an asset maybe you're trying to put on the blockchain there. And let's go ahead and create this. Waiting for the confirmation. So again, under five seconds for the confirmation. And now if we go right down to the very bottom, there it is, Pizza Russ. And now you can see various asset functions in the way of sending assets, modifying assets, freezing them, unfreezing them. That's good for game use, right? If you have a, somebody you want to penalize them, you freeze it. Yeah, yeah, you know, no, no trading for you. No soap for you. <laughs> and what you could do then is unfreeze them, like later on in the game or whatever, right? And re revoking assets, leading assets, they're all part of that. Now, let's take a look at one of our explorers. So this link will open the asset, and this is going to bring up our Algo Explorer. This is by Rand Labs. And there you can see there's the asset, just like that. We just created it. It's already on the blockchain. And so this is a great way to verify, especially what you're doing in testnet when you're developing, say, okay, did this thing really get written out there? Well, there it is. You, it's open in public, right? So you can browse, you can see it. There's uh, many different networks here. You got mainnet, testnet, beta net, all available. The mainnet, I go into that. It's always got the price of the algo on there, always going up. That looks good of late. So that's a good thing. And then also we'll take a look at another one too with Algo, excuse me, we looked at Algo Explorer IO. There's another one here with Pure Stake. And we're gonna take a look at that in a second. So let's take a look at this Algo signer. So those that are familiar with Ethereum, this is a MetaMask type equivalent. It's actually a Chrome extension. And this is how it works. I've got my uh, account wired up to testnet. You can go testnet mainnet. I'm going to bring up this pizza account and I'm going to take an address and I'm going to send some algos. So you can see I got 87 algos. It's going to send one of these to um, an address. And there's the note field that you can populate in this case with a string. Programmatically, of course, you can create a structure there if you wanted to, uh, to use that. So I'm going to go ahead and send that and let's go ahead and put our password in. And there it is. So I'm going to copy this off and let's go take a look at that other explorer by PureStake. And both PureStake and Rand Labs have APIs that are available as well to, to use this programmatically. This is pretty cool. So I'm on Testnet and I'm going to go ahead and search that particular transaction. And up it comes. There it is, the one algo. I sent one algo. There's the receiver account. There's the sender account. There's my note that got entered in. You got some additional info down below. The round number it happened in, the Genesis ID, you know, it was on, done on testnet. There's a Genesis hash for that particular transaction, what the fee was, and the date, right? 43 seconds ago. This is live, right? So there it is. So this is pretty cool. And then also you have developer portal for this one as well as the developer portal for this one all right so there you can see all the, that access to that as well i'll talk more about those services in a little bit all right let's get into atomic transfers and what this is all about they all must succeed or all fail very analogous to a sql database anybody got sql database experience out there tie together a lot of transactions in one big one if they, any of those fails rolls back the way it looked beforehand same thing here and this really is very nice because think about it. Person A sends 50 algos to person B. Person B is going to return a concert ticket to person A. This has always been the problem with trying to buy tickets like on Craigslist, right? You don't trust the person that you're doing the transaction with. And many people have gotten burned because of that. So it's trustless. This is beautiful. I can do these transactions with somebody I don't know, and I can be guaranteed exchange of goods. 
And you can do up to 16 of these in, in one fell swoop. So if person A does not send the required amount to person B of 50 algos, they only send them 25, all bets are off. On the other hand, if person D does not send the ticket back, you could say within a certain amount of time or whatever, then everything's null and void. I get my money back, guaranteed. It never actually goes to the person B until the transaction is complete. But you know what the best thing is? This is the secret sauce. This combine, you can combine with other Algorand technology. You can combine using this with assets. You can combine this with smart contracts. And now you can start architecting solutions that use atomic transfers as part of the glue that ties all these different parts together. So what are some examples of atomic transfers? You got simplified expedited settlement, You've got circular trades, distributed payments are all in the mix. Group payments, combining with the Algorand ASA and smart contracts. So a lot of good uh, examples there. <clears throat> so let's talk about smart contracts next. So we have a transaction execution approval language or TEAL, which is assembly and runs right on the blockchain. You might be saying, gee, why assembler, Russ? Come on. <laughs> you know, I've been there and done that. Remember the lean and mean thing we we're talking about? It doesn't get leaner and meaner than assembly language, right? On the blockchain. And the VMs to do interpreters and compiles and all that stuff, those are very bulky and very, very time consuming. But we've got all their solutions, right? For those that really don't want to get down to the assembly language level. It's not too bad, by the way. Once you get in there, you get the flow of things and how it works. But where there is, for example, all the Python devs out there, there's a Python-enabled compiler or PyTeal. Uh, you got two types of smart contracts. You got uh, stateless and stateful. So stateless returns true or false. Returns true, it signs it, and boom, you got spending going on. Stateful provides the ability to store state on the blockchain globally for everyone to utilize or local storage at the account level. So these are combinable with other Algorand technologies. Everything's combinable basically here, right? Atomic transfers, assets, and you can actually combine stateless and stateful contracts together. So Algorand stateless smart contracts, basically you've got two types here. You got a logic account and a signature, delegated authority. These are very similar except for the logic account, simply returns true or false. And these are good for escrow style accounts, split payments, hash time lock contracts. But the logic signature, in addition to returning true, it also must be signed by a delegated authority. So there's one extra layer of protection there. And this is great for recurring payments. And I'll show you that uh, today in the code as well. So when you are doing stateful smart contracts, just like we had the like life cycle with assets where you can create the asset, you can opt in, you can transact, you can manage it. Same type of analogous scenario here for stateful smart contract life cycle. And you create it, you get yourself an application ID, not an address. And you opt in, you get to participate with the local storage. Also, the creator can opt in as well, and their local storage would be on the creator's uh, account. You have a no op, which is calling the app to run. You can update the application as well as delete the application. You can close out the application. Uh, TL logic must be true to do that. And then clear state, uh, the difference between that and close out, it will always clear no matter what. Let's talk about accounts. <clears throat> so you have a standard account, multi-signature account, and a logic account or an logic sig. Well, a standard account has a private and public key and belongs to, say, an individual. A multi sig account would have several uh, possible members to it. And this is analogous to like when you bring a check to the bank, some checks got to be signed by two people in order to cash it. So the threshold is two. And you can have, say, 10 in a multi sig, for example. And you could set the threshold to two or three, let's say three, or then three out of the 10 must sign off on it. And up only at that point 
would you be able to do a transaction from that multi-sig account? Logic account is a smart contract that returns true and signs it and returns false, it doesn't. That brings us to rekeying and a deeper discussion on public key versus a private key. A public key, you want everybody to know that because that's how you're going to get money. <laughs> that's how you get do re me assets. You want to say, people want to say, okay, send me, send me some money. Here's my public key. Boom. Just like I did a transaction in algo signing. When I pasted it in that account, that was a public key. Whereas a private key, on the other hand, is used to do the spending. That's the one that spends money. That's the one you don't want anyone to have because you don't want them spending your money. So what rekeying facilitates, and no other blockchain has this, by the way, it easily facilitates growth. So if you have a single account, which on the left with a pair of orange and green keys there, and let's say your organization grows and you get a board of directors, now you want to have a multi-sig account do the, the, the spending and or maybe you got some new logic rules and business rules that you need to apply to it now you actually want to use a multi-sig account perhaps to do that well up until this point there was very difficult to do this you actually had to create a brand new account and go through it and that's very cumbersome and time consuming so you notice what's on the upper right you have this is a fields in the transaction you can see there's an authorized address for this account that begins with L42 to authorize NFF to go ahead and sign it. So this guy's really got the spending key now and he could uh, sign it uh, right there with that NFF account. That's all there is to it. Very simple in, in nature and it really uh, works very nicely for Rekeying. We do have an Algorand wallet. That's the easiest way to work with the assets. There are, it's a developer mode too, where you can uh, toggle to over to testnet. So you can use a testing right out of your wallet. Uh, you can rekey right to the ledger. It has a uh, Nano X Bluetooth ledger support and then asset support as well. So it's a pretty cool wallet. Smart contract value, uh, the finance industry, many applications here, including trade finance, clearing and settlement, financial data recording as well as digital identity. So escrow for DeFi, payments, credit, in lending, as well as stable coins, what we've talked about already. So what about reporting on the data that's in the blockchain? You got millions of blocks out there. So if you were to do a query against the native blockchain, which was the only way to do it initially, it was pretty time consuming, right? To traverse all those blocks to find whatever you're looking for. So AlgoD is a, a daemon, one of our three daemons. There's a KMD, which is another one, which is for an online wallet. And also Indexer is a daemon too. And what this does is it offloads this data into a Postgres SQL database, which is indexed and you can do queries very quickly on it. So this is the solution, right? And many of the SDKs have the ability to utilize Indexer as an endpoint in the SDKs. The four SDKs on top are the ones that Algorand supports, Go, Java, JavaScript, and Python. And then you have, this is all with V2, they call it, for version two of our rollout on this particular feature a few months back. So how do you build uh, an index or how do you use it? Well, you can build your own and there's a link uh, there to build your own. It could be very large. It could be 200 gig. And it's also uses a service. There's another way to do it. So Pure Stake and Algo Explorer, like I mentioned, have stand-up instances already available. The easiest way to access this is through Sandbox, which is a tool I'm going to show in a little bit as well. But when you bring this up by, by default, the, the, it's a private network, which is like a personal network on your own to do testing with, and it includes an indexer index by default. That's because it starts at the Genesis block <laughs> and goes from there and it indexes as it goes right from the beginning. So really pretty brilliant concept by our engineering team. So let's get into a uh, kind of an architectural diagram a little bit, combining some of the layer one features for the voting example we had talked about. So you got a voting commission and you got a voting token. Now these are all gonna be atomically grouped. So this all has to work or none of it works, right? And so you vote for candidate A and that might go through some validation with a smart contract. If everything is validated and everything's legit, then it'll go ahead and increment the candidate A total to a global state on a blockchain, boom. That's it. Now you got it readily available 
And this is how you'd go about doing something like that. Another example is crowdfunding. For those folks that are unfamiliar with that, you've got a great idea. You want to get folks to invest. So you say, okay, I want to invest. I want to raise X amount of dollars. If I don't uh, raise X amount of dollars, then uh, you all get your money back and no product for the money because uh, all bets are off. So we've got a crowdfunding escrow account set up, right, with all the monies that are being collected. The payment from escrow one to user one. Now, these are all atomically grouped. Everything looks good. But then the start, you might have a staple smart contract then saying, okay, yeah, we've compared this to, you know, what we have uh, as a target that we want to do it. So this is a go, you know, we're full go here. So we can go ahead and start issuing products to these folks and I can start using the funds for my invention. So that's the, the scenario there. So again, the way you, you orchestrate all this is through atomic transactions. Okay. Robust, comprehensive developer resources on our dev portal, developer.algorand.org. You can see there, there is a uh, getting started section. We also recently won a uh, Debbie award for best innovation of blockchain for the developer portal. Let me just bring this up and you can take a peek here. So the documentation is the place that you want to get started with. So we had a question on getting started. So click on docs, click on start building. And then these are the steps. You want to set up your workspace. You want to connect to a node. Then you want to do a first transaction. And this is revolving around smart contracts. So those are the step-by-steps you can do. Now, speaking of step-by-steps, we have lots of tutorials out here. You can also filter. You just want to filter by language. Maybe just look at the C-sharp ones. And there, uh, that comes up with all the C-sharp ones. Here's one I wrote for using VS Code with C-sharp. So it, it gives you step-by-step to use. This is nice because the SDK uh, for C Sharp has a lot of console apps in it, uh, sample apps. And this is how I run them. I run them through uh, VS Code to do that. You can use Visual Studio as well, but VS Code is really taking on the market in popularity. Uh, so tutorials got step by steps. You know, you click on one of these, you got each step listed out there and a lot of screenshots. And at the bottom of these typically are links to the source code. Also at the documentation, any of the features you look up, like here, creation methods, right? You come down here at the bottom, there'll be a link to the source code. Also, you got articles and solutions that are published. And we got the forms as well as a new thing with some metrics on that. And we talked about this a little bit, but this describes it better in terms of the algorithm networks. You got testnet and mainnet. The protocol is identical in each of those. So the idea here is that if it works in testnet, it'll work in mainnet. New protocols are introduced in BetaNet, and then you have private networks could use any of these networks. And that's, like I said, I like to think of that as a personal network. A couple of use cases for that. Maybe you're experimenting with a new feature in BetaNet, and you want to have things stable a little bit so you can do some testing on a particular feature. But BetaNet is always getting refreshed. And so that can cause havoc in your testing. So what you do is create a private network, this is a snapshot, and then you start working in your own environment. So it's a future protocol is what that would be in your own private network. So that's a good use. And then you can create your own node if you like. You can do this on, I'm going to fix this slide right now. I just did this last night. All right. And we got to add windows on there. So you can create your own on a Mac, Ubuntu, uh, Windows, other Linux distros as well as, for example, a Raspberry Pi. This used to take several hours to sync. And it still does if you use uh, index and archive. But if you don't, most people only need like the last thousand blocks. And so now fast catch up is here. So you can say, okay, what's the last catch up point we got? And then let's just go forward from that. And in a matter of minutes, you are caught up and can be productive. Pure Stake and RAN Labs have API services. Now those are fully indexed and fully archived nodes. These can be accessed from the SDK code, ideally even on platforms that do not have nodes. So like on my phone, I've got my phone here and there's no local host on it and there's no server on it. So how do I write an app that will utilize blockchain. That's where Pure Stake and RAN Labs would come in handy. You'd be able to access those services and you're off and running. And then another option is a sandbox. 
which is just running Docker. It's not for production and the snapshots start from the current node. There's no sync time as well as a fast catch up basically is what they do. So GitHub, you clone the sandbox repository, install Docker, and that lets you start working with Algorand. And uh, the sandbox also works on uh, Windows as well. So you just clone it. When you do sandbox up, you get the private network that includes indexers. So that's the default. If you want to use it for a test net, you just put that as a parameter. And you can also get, get wired up to beta net or main net as well. So maybe you're troubleshooting a problem on an account in main net. You can fire up sandbox with main net and then try to replicate it in your sandbox. So it's very volatile though. Anytime you do a clean, everything goes and you start over again fresh, which is okay because that's what you want really a lot of times. And uh, that said, it's really not for production. It really is for testing and development purposes. This is what the readme file looks like. So these are the addresses that you see on the screen here. Uh, Localhost 401, you can see or 8980 for the indexer. Uh, so these are the port numbers and the tokens you'd put in your code to have available to you. So we got lots of code tools and we got Reach was a very cool product that you can write an application in a higher level language like JavaScript and you get to deploy it to multiple blockchains with just a flip of a switch in the settings. So you can go to Ethereum and Algorand, you know, with the same code base, which is brilliant. Analogous to when we were started doing cross development apps with uh, React Native and, and Xamarin and Unity where you write it once and then you deploy it to many different platforms. It's the same idea there with Reach. We talked about PyTeal as well as Teal. And then we got the SDKs and then we got lots of IDs, Algodia, that's the one you want to download first. That's an IntelliJ plugin and it is incredible. I will show you that very shortly. RockX, good way to do some testing. Algodesk.io I showed you. The SDKs that we have in the community, right? These are PHP. We got a couple of those. We got a, the C Sharp one. I'll show you quite a bit of tonight, I'm giving them some mobile app. And really, up until recently, like this past week, that was the only way to develop a mobile app that went to all the platforms for Algorand because that was the only uh, solution, cross platform solution. But guess what? This past week, uh, a Swift SDK was announced for iOS. So all you that are doing, doing native uh, development, there's a Swift SDK. For those that are doing games, like I mentioned, now there's a Algorand Unity a GitHub. So things are getting exciting and really a lot of uh, promise here. And then this is the tutorial I did to just create accounts and that's done with C Sharp. And so now what I'm gonna do is wire it up to my local host. So I've got the sandbox running right there. And then what I'm going to do is run this. And now it's going to go down below and create these three, three accounts. So what I've done here is I've got the address itself and then the mnemonic, which you, like you saw displayed on the Algodesk. And I, pr I printed those off down below. Now in a production application, you would never of course display these secret keys in any shape or manner or restore accounts in the code, like you're gonna see me demonstrating a lot here today. That's really for tutorial and learning purposes. You would actually wanna integrate with a wallet or MyAlgo Connect is another alternative, a web-based solution or Algo Signer. Those are all things that you uh, would like to try to do. So the last uh, thing I print off here is see the testnet dispenser because none of these have algos in them. And so our dispenser, is right here. I'm going to say I'm not a robot. Paste in this address. And now it's going to dispense funds. So now that's going to have some funds available to it. And this is the sandbox that's running. So here is the, again, the address, the local host. You can, we have actually have a command line tool to goal. And what you can do is you can just, uh, you know, type that in right down below and you'd be able to do some queries with the uh, goal. And it gives you some examples right at the end on some you know curl commands and things of that nature that you can utilize for that. And what we see here is we've got the ability to create iOS, Android, and Windows apps, right? UWP apps using the C Sharp SDK, uh, .NET SDK, and Xamarin, and hence the mobile topic for tonight. So these are screenshots of where we're gonna be going with this session that works on both factors, iPad and, and iPhone. 
Also, you've got a tablet and phone for Android, a UWP apps as well. And then the, where are the secret keys stored? There's a secure storage class that you can li- utilize and you can store uh, the keys there. That's the way wallets work. They would store the keys in that particular location. And then I do have a tutorial out there. And, uh, and there, there is the URL for the solution and what we're going to be showing you. So you can take a picture of that or you'll have this link uh, at the end as well. In fact, I'll just put this into the transaction. All right. Once this comes up, now I'll give you the lay of the land with the app. This is where you, you set up your nodes and settings. Then you go des- you do test net, beta net, go up to peer stake instances. Uh, <clears throat> also a hackathon instance we have available for hackathons. Or you can enter your testnet node, which is where you'd put that uh, local host 404. But actually, you would need to actually get the physical IP address. So if I, what you have to, local host won't work here because we don't have a local host available on the phone when it gets deployed. So you have to go to your, in Windows, you just do IP config from a command line. On preferences, you just go to, where's network? Right here. And then it would be listed right up there. So that would be where your IP address would be for that option. So we're going to use this hackathon instance. And then here's the accounts and transactions. And I've already created three accounts. You can see I can do uh, get balances on each of these. I can also get block information. So this will hit the breakpoint over here on the left. And you can see first I'm going to get the status through the async. This is the client, right, which gets instantiated. And then we have the next uh, line that's going to hit the breakpoint on, which is get the block based off of that round that we extracted from the status from the blockchain. So we'll just let that run through, and then you can see the block information print off below. I'm putting this into a web view so that you can click on things and copy them and not change it. <laughs> so that was the only way I came up with that. If anybody's got a better solution, please uh, let me know, Okay. Now we're gonna do a transfer. So I'm gonna transfer from account one to account two. And now this is where we start hitting the, the work, right? So we're gonna do a, a transfer from account one. So there's the address. And we're gonna to go to account two. And then we're gonna do an amount. So let's do one algo. These are micro algos right here. We also have parameters that are being passed in, which would be from this parameter call right there. And then, We'll go ahead and just let this run. Now, there's going to be two, two steps here. So one is we want to sign it. So this gives you the tran- this gives you the transaction. And then we take that transaction and we're going to say we're going to sign it by account one. So that's the sender. That's the one that's got to be signing it. And then after you've done this, then what you want to do is broadcast this transaction to the blockchain. So you're going to submit this blockchain and, and send a raw broadcast to, to, now everyone will see it. Up until this point, only your node sees it. And at this point, now it's on the blockchain. And so when that gets done, it'll say, okay, successfully sent. There's the transaction and you're off and running. So I'm just going to continue hit running here. And now we should see there's the transaction that just uh, fired off. Okay. I'm going to stop here for a second. And I'm going to show you a very cool tool uh, right now called Algodia. And with Algodia, it's A-L-G-O and then D-E-A. It runs out of the Intel idea as a plugin. So the first thing you notice here, you've got the local SDK. So this is where your uh, instances is installed locally if you run your own node. Or you can add nodes. Here, just add an Algorand node. I can uh, say I want to do one for Algo Explorer, right, with RAN Labs. Well, you put the server name, what the endpoint is, what the API key is, and that's it. And then if there's an indexer, it's available there. You can do that, and then you hit OK, and then it populates. And then you just right mouse click and say, OK, this is the one I want to use for compilation or deployment. So I'm using the Pure Stake Testnet instance. And what I can do is I can just right mouse click here and I can go to accounts and I can say create new account. So we did this programmatically, but this is all doing it visually through the IDE. And that's why I wanted to contrast the, the, the difference. So go to Russ demo for the name for the new account. And then to see it now, here it is. You got your passphrase, you got the address and 
But what you can do then is go to Algorand and accounts and say, list all the ones in this project that I have. And there's the new one, right, that I just did. In fact, if you want to fetch balances to see how much are in these, you can see there's no algos in that account. And all I would do is just write mouse click, copy the address, go up to the dispenser and dispense some funds to it, just like I did before. So this makes it very easy. Now, one other thing I'm going to show you while I'm here is, is this is a stateless contract. So no state is on this. It just returns true or false. If it returns true, it's going to send a, a, a signed transaction. This is called the logic state is what we're looking at. It's very simple. All right. I've got a receiver that's going to receive funds. So Bob has to be the receiver all right, when we send this for this to work. The amount has to be 10 algos or less. So less than or equal to 10 algos. If that returns all true, it's a stack based language, pops it off the stack, then this will get signed. So this is how we do it here in Algodia. I'm going to take this teal uh, program. I'm going to go down to Algorand. I'm going to say, okay, let's do a stateless contract and let's generate a logic sig. Now, these are the two types I talked about in the slides. You can do a contract account which simply returns true or false, or you can also sign it. And I'm going to have to delegate it. I'm going to send from Alice to Bob. So Alice is going to be sending, uh, and, and we want Bob to be doing the receiving. So I'm going to click OK here. Now, what this generates is my, up in the LSIG folder, I've got an LSIG that's been created. And now I can say send a transaction from this LSIG. And that LSIG must be populated. So there is an address down in the, the window down below where you can make sure you've got funds in there. That's your, like your escrow account to send out for logic SIG. Here, let's make the receiver Rust demo. Let's give this Rust demo all lowercase some money here today. Okay, I'm going to click OK. Now, this is not going to work, right? Because it's not going to Bob, it's going to Rust. So I'll hit OK. And now it executes and it says, boy, stateless failed. And it gives you the reason over here at the end as to why it failed. It's got to go to the receiver, Bob. So now let's do the same thing. We'll send a logic sig here. And this is going to go from Alice. We're going to go to Bob this time. And let's send in 10 as well. If I typed in 20, it wouldn't work again. So very simple idea, but hopefully you get the kind of the logic here piece of this down. And there it is, it successfully sent the transaction. So that is an example of a stateless contract. What do you think? Crowd goes wild. Oh, yay! All right, so another great tool in your arsenal. All right. And I'm actually um, going to show you now these functions all from that, that Xamarin app and uh, C Sharp. I did do a video recently with JavaScript. So it's blockchain for JavaScript developers. It's the same first part that we did, but all the code is in JavaScript. So any JavaScript developers, you can look that up on our YouTube channel. You can see your examples there. And I'm gonna go back to that accounts page. So once again, our network settings are set to go to the hackathon instance. Now what I'm going to do here is create a multi-sig address. All right, so this is how you create it. You have basically who's in the group. I got three accounts in the group. What is my threshold? Two out of those three must sign this transaction. And this is the version number that's associated with that multi-sig. So this multi-sig is always going to have the same address if you use the same order and the same threshold. And that is the address that you would need to populate with funds. So that's going to come back before we do a transaction. So I'm just going to run here. And there is our multi-sig. And notice I got in the UI here, funds are needed, right? That's zero in there. So I'm going to hit funds. Let's go to yes. It's going to go out to the dispenser. It's already pre-populating the field in there. And there it is. Now we dispense the funds. So now we've got funds in there. So let's go ahead and send a multi-sig transaction. So what the multi-sig transaction is going to do is then it's going to say, okay, we're going to send it from our multi-signature multi address. And what's gonna happen here? I've got two signings that are needed that you can see right down below. So I'm gonna do my multi-sig address. This is where I'm going to be sending it from. This is where, uh, this is going to the account number three. 
which is the one that is going to receive the funds. That's the amount we want to send. And then if I come down over here, we're going to sign the transaction with two accounts right here. So here's the first one being signed in this TX that we have right here. And then that's account one doing the signing. And then we're going to have account two go ahead and sign it. We're going to append that to the prior one. And now what we're going to have is both of those go into the transaction. And so this wait to, to complete is a good routine to call that waits the amount of time till it's actually written to the blockchain. So it, your program doesn't get ahead of itself. It, it actually knows when it's on the blockchain and I'm just going to hit run here. And so now it should say it was successfully sent uh, down below. And there it is. And it tells you what the new balance is on that account that just got uh, created here today. So that's the demo on transactions and accounts. So let's talk about atomic transfers. I think that's what we had on our uh, list. ASA too, and atomic transfers. All right, let's do ASA. So I'm going to do a standard asset. And these are all the different capabilities you have for doing an asset. But the first thing is you want to create an asset. This is what's going to be done first. And so let's go ahead and create this asset. And then what's going to happen, it's going to give you an ID that will get returned back. And then you'll be able to use that ID as a parameter in other transactions. This is what makes, makes it unique, is this ID. And again, you don't need to have a, a smart contract create these assets. These are natively supported on layer one. And this is a, a, a pretty cool thing when you think about it. Because now, if I add an asset to my wallet and I'm searching by name, you can have the same named asset out there. You can have the same short name of an asset out there. The unique qualifier is the ID number, and that appears in the list as well. So if someone says opt into this asset, it's got this ID number, you know exactly which one it is. It's not, there's no question about it. So that's by design. All right, so now it's created this asset. So there's the asset ID down here in the, in the display. Now I'm gonna go ahead and configure this. And by configure, I'm gonna change who does what. Right now, the asset is all the functions are done by this UX or UQ uh, address that you see listed down below here in the window. And what I want to do is I want to change the manager to be account one, which is the, the creator account, the UX account. Or no, the creator account is the UQ account. Everybody else is set to that accordingly. So what I'm going to do here is just hit run. And this is the call to change it. So that's the account two is, is the current manager. And you want to take that transaction. That's the, the whole class that we're calling back in there. And I'm going to fire this off. And then what we'll see is the configuration complete. And once that uh, happens, now I can opt into this. So I'm going to hit the opt in button as a user. I want to opt into this. So I'm going to say, okay, this account three wants to opt into it. So now there, again, there's a, a method call to do that. Everything else is the same, right? You create the transaction, you sign it, and then you submit the transaction. That process is always one, two, three. And now we'll go ahead and do a transfer. So all these were visually available in that Algodesk IO. You saw me hit that drop down menu. Now we're showing you the code that they use to create it and that you might want to use in your application. All right, so now we've done the transfer. So you can see I've opted in before the balance was zero. Now account three has got the 10 that were transferred to it. Then we want to do a freeze. Now maybe we want to freeze the, the uh, account that to no longer be able to do transactions on their own. This does not prevent a clawback from a, a managing clawback account. So now you can see the freeze is set to uh, true right there in the uh, display out here. And then uh, let's do the revoke. This is the uh, clawback one. And so now this is going to revoke this back. So the balance now again should be uh, zero. And there it is. And then finally, we're going to destroy. If you own all the assets, you can destroy it. And uh, then you can see the code there doing just that. Okay, and that is destroyed. So that's our ASA demo. And then this next demo is revolving around atomic transfers. So this is going to go 
from account one, there's going to be two transactions. We're going to wrap up in this transfer. Account one is going to go to account two. And account one is also going to send in a transaction to account three. And both got to happen. So here you have the, uh, the code here on the left. Those are the two transactions. We're going to go from account one to account two. And then you see we're going from account one to account three. I believe the amounts are different. No, that's one algo here. I know they're the same. Then one algo here. So what the magic is doing this uh, group ID. So this is where we're going to glue these together into one, one unit, right? And this is the group transactions. So we're going to create, create a new group and a transaction ID. We're going to throw both of our transactions in so they both have the same group transaction ID. Then that's where we sign it. And then we sign each one. And then we can get, oh, this is the account information call to get the information you saw being displayed on the screen. And there is the before amount. And then we're going to go ahead and do the send the raw transaction out, wait for it to uh, get done. And then we're going to put the after amount down there. So let's go ahead and do this. All right. So there you see it ends with 899-6000. And there were two transactions with one each. And it comes up at 6994. So that account now is two less than it was before. So it all worked. And that's the, the transaction information right there. All right. Let's take a look at, we did the contract layer and dele delegated account. I showed you that now. Go ID. There's a compile, right? Though so this is just doing a simple compile of this data that got read in, which is just, I think it's int one. And I'm just going to compile that. And basically, I don't have a UI done here on this. I'm getting, so you're just going to see the code from here. I did this. So then we've got the dry run debugging. So I'll talk about, actually, I got a slide. And let me bring up the deck, actually. So this is the PyTeal library. And so this will take your Python and generate Teal. It's very simple. And I was about to show you a demo that does the co compilation of Teal to be utilized then in an application. So there's, this is just a PyTeal compile from Python to Teal. And then you will need to compile this into a byte array to be used as calls into the uh, applications whenever you're using uh, Teal. So this is the sequence, right? Python compiles the Teal, now you got the source, and then you use the SDK compile method to uh, utilize that as a parameter parameter in your in your program. Now, when you go to do debugging, there are three things that you want to debug: accounts, signed transactions, and the approval program, which is the main program that you want to run. So these get all wrapped up in what's called the dry run request, and then you can use a debugger called Teal Debug to go ahead and debug these, and that is done through Chrome Inspect. And this will bring up a browser, and then you can step through each line, set breakpoints, and you can analyze what's in your local storage and global storage every step of the way. So this is a pretty cool little debugging demo. And then also we've got the ability to do rekeying as well. And so what I'm going to do is just show you the compile teal. So again, that's just doing a teal compile of that int. And then, so that was done. And then next thing I'm going to do is a dry run and then rekeying. And then what you see here is you've got the rekey to address. So I'm going to rekey this to from account three to account one is going to be the person that signs off on it. And so what this will do is go ahead and do that rekey. And then you can see that specified right down below. Say, I really want address one to sign off on this. And now we're good to go instead of three. Now it's very simple to, to do that. So that has been established. Now the last demo is actually the stateful uh, teal. And to do this, I cloned the repository, the .NET repository. And so what we're going to do is we're going to create the app. And then you'd opt into the app. And there's two accounts here in this program. You got the creator is going to be doing one of these. Then the client, you're going to have a user account that wants to opt into that and utilize that smart contract. Then you've got the ability to call the app and execute it. 
And then this is this routine would read the local state, and then you'll see the the local state get printed out down below. And then also you would read the global state, and you could see the global state in the counters that are down below. Now we want to update the application. And what the update is going to do, it's going to take a refactored program. We got two programs in here. And the only difference is the second one uses a date timestamp on it. That's the only difference between the two TEAL programs. So now you want to update this program to include that, that new feature. And that's what you would use this update app function for. And then finally, we're going to call that app once again. But now we're calling the new one that got put out there. It's the same app ID that it had before. And then now this is going to have this date and time put out into that particular node's uh, local storage. And that's it. And then you close out, opt in, call the app, and then you delete it when you're done. And so that is the flow that you would have in that uh, example. There was one other thing to show you in the application for Indexer. Visual Studio to, uh, for Mac or Visual Studio Community 2019 is what you need to use for Xamarin. For those that are new to Xamarin, it's basically three projects you have. You've got where all the code is in the common library. And then you have Android, iOS, and I would have Windows if I was running this on my Windows machine. And so it's nice to have one, one common approach. I'm going to run this and just show you the uh, indexer code that's in here just to give you a feel for some of the queries that you can do. And you can also do a lot of these queries with, with REST API tools like uh, Postman or something like that. And there you can see, I'm gonna look up transactions right here. So I'm gonna look up transactions for this particular address I'm gonna pass in and give me a limit of 10. And so when I run this now down below in the, the, the output window, you'll see that information displayed, right, for those 10 accounts. Similarly, I've got, you can search for applications, all applications, and give me a limit on that. You can also specify an app ID, so you can look up smart contracts, and we can look up by the ID, or you can do a search for all assets that have a unit name of LAT, or you could do a look up by asset ID. So all those are examples that you can do as well as you can uh, download. Uh, I've got a run in Postman on the website. You can, this has got an account I'm gonna do. This is uh, actually just going against the REST API and I'll go, but here you can see the nice makeup of this REST API call. Here's the endpoint I'm gonna be using. Give me all the accounts for that address. And you can see I've got assets. These are all the folks that have opted into it. You got your overall amount balance on there. Also, you've got created apps. Remember that tree diagram we saw in the beginning where these are all associated with an account? Not only created apps, but those that are opted into the apps. And then similarly, not only those that are opted into assets, but those that actually created the assets on that account. So all that information is, is in that response. All right, and there's the, the endpoints, like I had mentioned. All you would do is hit run in Postman. I've got one here for AlgoD and one for Indexer. Then you're off and running. These are useful, more useful for uh, the private network, right? Because in the private network, you do not have access to the explorers. It's your own network. So they're not going to know about your network. So e what we got to do is either get the community to build an explorer for your private network, or you can use uh, run at Postman. I always like to utilize that anyway, you know, just to make sure everything is working. All right, great developer newsletter. Again, enter that if you haven't yet. We're going to be doing the drawing pretty soon. I do want to talk about the community projects and I'll end with, this is the REACH uh, program we talked about. And this is, uh, right now it's JavaScript, but they're going to more languages. I think they announced Go and Python and Java in addition to JavaScript. I think they said they had the framework that they could use for C-sharp as well. And so to refresh your memory, this is the, the tool that I said we can deploy to multiple blockchains using one language. As this is wicked cool, as they used to say up in New England when I lived up there. Also, you've got the Algo Signer API. And so this is a MetaMask like Chrome wallet. And then we just had uh, this session last week on our developer office hours. Every other Tuesday, we have a, a session. I'll give you the link for that in a little bit. But this is a good production solution for utilizing private keys with your application. You would basically utilize my algo wallet in conjunction with that. This is not an extension to a browser like the algo signer was. 
This is actually uh, an application that you would utilize in conjunction with yours. The Algodia, I showed you that right up front. That is a great tool. This will be your first download. All right, this is your homework assignment. Download this first. You know, there was a nonprofit out there that was inquiring about how to get started. And well, you might find some funding programs as well to assist that cause. There's a developer awards program, as well as a Algorand developer ambassador rewards program. With that one there, you can create content like Philippe did on our developer portal. Arena, I think might have something in the works there too, coming up. And then the grant programs, and you can see a list of grant recipients. We're also looking for scouts and there's some information on security. So some good links there. If you are interested in joining the ambassador program, send an email to Stephen at algorand.foundation. So Algorand Foundation is a completely separate entity and company from Algorand Inc. I work for Algorand Inc. Algorand Foundation handles all the token economics of the algo. The algo is our native currency, so they handle that whole side of things. There's another couple of good videos to watch up on YouTube, our teal and pure proof stake. Group proof of stake. And then where are the code samples? Again, that's Xamarin C Sharp app I showed you as the first link. Then we've got the files, the docs a repository has all the examples under that that are in the features. And then uh, the hackathon on Algorand DevRel has a, a few good uh, samples out there as well as a smart contract DEX, DEX example in JS. So a lot of good resources there. This is the developer office hours I, I mentioned. Sign up at algorand.com developers. This is the resource for Discord. I really encourage you to join this right after you download Algodia. <laughs> Go to Discord. This is number two on your list. Uh, we got over 3,000 developers out there now on Discord, and it's growing all the time. This is your great way to get support. If uh, you got a problem, odds are somebody else has had that problem too. This PowerPoint is located at that URL. And then we got a lot of uh, tutorials and a lot of resources here. Algorand Studio, I didn't even mention that yet. That's a great uh, tool to manage your solutions with. You've got the Algorand Playground at algorand.rockx.com. You've got an Algorand Builder, another great tool. So in summary, we covered a lot of things, a lot of ground here tonight. It was really a pleasure presenting, and I really thanked all the developers out there. They were chanting along with me, man. That's the first time. That is a first we've ever done on one of my sessions, okay? It's about time, long overdue. We got the blockchain use cases. We covered the why part of this, why blockchain. And scalability is number one, along with security. And, and you've got a tamper-proof solution. And there are so many applications that need this tamper proof audit trail audit trails are built right in to the blocking built right in so you don't even have to worry about adding that on that comes for free when you build a blockchain solution you also have the basics we covered so everybody was brand new to blockchain and some of you were maybe had some ethereum experience i know you were asking some ethereum related questions in the queue there we also looked at layer one features on building tokens, your own tokens, your own Russ Pizza coin or whatever. And uh, that was through ASA. And then we looked at uh, smart contracts. We looked at uh, atomic transfers, which is the secret sauce that, that ties a lot of solutions together on the Algorand blockchain. And they're all right on the blockchain. And they're very fast and very performant as well as smart contracts. So developer tools, a ton of tools, and it's getting better all the time. There's a lot of tools out there in the way of IDEs and now plugins for VS Code and utilities, visual utilities to create assets. And the list is getting bigger and bigger. I've got to update the community page every couple of weeks, it seems like, with the, everything that's going on there. And I'm going to end with this slide. Again, this has the link on the survey. Thank you. Thank you.